we want to spend the time today talking about uh, your view of the future and what people should work on. So to start off, could you tell us, you famously said when you were younger there were five problems that you thought were most important for you to work on. Mm -hmm. um, if you were 22 today, what would the five problems that you would think about working on be? Um, well, first of all, I, th I think um, if, if somebody is doing something that is useful to the, the rest of society, I think that's a good thing. Like, it doesn't have to change the world. Like, you know, um, if you're doing something that has high value to, to people, um, and, and frankly, even if it's something, if it's like um, just a little game um, or, you know, the <laughs> some improvement in photo sharing or something, if it, if it, has, if it has a small amount of, of good uh, for a large number of people, um, that's, I mean, I think that's, that's fine. Like, stuff doesn't need to be changed the world just to be good. Um, uh, but, it, you know, in terms of things that I think are most likely to affect the, the future of humanity, I think um, AI is probably the single biggest item in the near term that's likely to affect uh, humanity. So it's very important that we have the advent of AI uh, in a good way. That, that uh, is something that... Um, if you if you could look into the crystal ball and, and see the future, you would like you would like that outcome, um, because it is something that could go um, could go wrong, um, as we've talked about many times, um, and so we really need to make sure it goes right. Um, that's that's I think AI work, working on AI and making sure it's a great future. That's that's the most important thing I think right now, um, the most pressing item. So, uh, then. Um, Obviously, anything to do with, with genetics. Um, if you can actually solve um, genetic diseases, um, if you can um, prevent dementia um, or Alzheimer's or something like that, that uh, um, with genetic reprogramming, that would be wonderful. So I think this uh, genetics it might be the sort of second most important item. I, I think um, having a high bandwidth interface to the, the brain, like. Um, we're currently bandwidth limited. We, we, we have a digital tertiary self uh, in the form of our email capabilities like computers, phones, applications. Uh, we're effectively superhuman, um, but we are extremely bandwidth constrained in that interface between the cortex and your sort of uh, that, that tertiary digital form of yourself. And um, helping solve that uh, bandwidth constraint uh, would, would be, I think, very important for the future as well. So uh, one of the, I think, most common questions I, I hear young people, ask, ambitious young people ask is, I want to be the next Elon Musk, how do I do that? Um, obviously, the next Elon Musk will work on very different things than, than you did, but what have you done or what did you do when you were younger that uh, you think sort of set you up to have a big impact? Well, I think first of all I should say that I do not expect to be involved in all these things. So the, 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 the five things that I thought about at the time in, in college, so quite a long time ago, uh, 25 years ago, um, you know, being, you know, making life multi-planetary, um, accelerating, accelerating the transition to sustainable energy, um, the, the internet, broadly speaking, um, and, and then genetics and AI. I think um, I didn't expect to be involved in, in, in all of those things. I actually, at the time in college, I, I sort of thought um, helping with electrification of, of, of cars was, was how I would start out, and that's, uh, that's actually what I worked on as an intern was um, advanced uh, ultra capacitors with, to see if, they, if there would be a breakthrough relative to batteries for energy storage in, in cars. And then when I came out to go to Stanford, um, that's what I was going to be doing my grad studies on is, um, is was working on advanced uh, uh, energy storage uh, technologies for electric cars. And then I put that on hold to start an internet company in, in 95 because um, the, 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 there does seem to be like a time for particular technologies uh, when they're at uh, a steep point in the inflection curve, and um, and I didn't want to, you know, do a PhD at Stanford and then and watch it all happen, um, and then and, and I wasn't entirely certain that the technology I'd be working on would actually succeed. Um, like you can get you can get a you know doctorate on many things that ultimately are not do not have a practical bearing on the world. Um, and I wanted to, you know, just, I, I really was just trying to be useful. That's the optimization. It's like, what, what, are the, what can I do that would actually be useful? Do you think people that want to be useful today should get PhDs? Um, mostly not. 
<laughs> so what, yeah. is, what is the best way Some to be useful? Some yes, but mostly not. Um, how should someone figure out how they can be most useful? Whatever this thing is that you're trying to create, what would, what would be the um, utility delta compared to the current state of the art times how many people it would affect? So that's why I think um, having something that has a that's, that has a makes makes a big difference but affects a sort of small to moderate number of people is great. As is something that makes even, even a small difference but it, but affects a vast number of people, like the area yeah. under you know under the, the, area curve. Under the curve. Yeah, exactly. The under, area under the curve is would actually be roughly similar for those two things. So it's actually really about um, uh, yeah, just trying to be useful and matter. And then when uh, you're trying to estimate probability of success. So you say this thing will be really useful, good mm -hmm. area under the curve. Uh, I guess to use the example of SpaceX. Mm -hmm. When you made the go decision that you were actually going to do that, this was kind of a very crazy thing at the time. Very um, crazy, very for sure. Crazy. Yeah, uh, well, I'm not sure about saying that. Um, but I kind of agree, I agreed with them that it was quite crazy. It, crazy if, um, if, the, if the objective was um, to achieve the um, best risk adjusted return, um, starting a rocket company is insane. Um, but that was not that was not my objective. I I I'd simply come to the conclusion um, that if something didn't happen to improve rocket technology, we'd be stuck on Earth forever. Um, and um, and the big aerospace companies had just had no interest in radical innovation. Um, all they wanted to do was try to make their old technology slightly better every year. And in fact, um, sometimes it would actually get worse. Um, and particularly in rockets, it's pretty bad. Like the in, in 69, we were able to go to the moon um, with a Saturn V, and then the space shuttle could only take people to low Earth orbit, and then the space shuttle retired. I mean, that, that trend is basically trends to zero. It, um, it, it, people sometimes think technology just automatically gets better every year, but uh, it actually doesn't. It only gets better if smart people work, work like crazy to make it better. That's how any technology actually gets better. And by itself, technology, if, if people don't work on it, actually will decline. Um, I mean, you can look, in, look at the history of civilizations, many civilizations, and, and look at, say, um, ancient Egypt, where they were able to build these incredible pyramids, and then they, they basically forgot how to build pyramids. Um, and, um, and then even hieroglyphics, they forgot how to read hieroglyph hieroglyphics. So you look at Rome, and how they were able to, to build these incredible roadways and aqueducts and, and indoor plumbing, and they forgot how to do all of those things. Um, and um, there are many such examples in, in history. Um, so I, I think um, I should always bear in mind uh, that, you know, en entropy is not on your side. Yeah. One, one thing I, I really like about you is you are unusually fearless and willing to go in the face of other people telling you something is crazy. And I know a lot of pretty crazy people, you still stand out. Uh, where does that come from or how do you think about making a decision when everyone tells you this is a crazy idea? Or where do you get the internal strength to do that? Well, first of all, I'd say I actually think I, I think I feel feel fear quite strongly. Um, so it's not as though I just have the absence of fear. I, I feel it quite strongly. Um, but there, there are just times when something is important enough, you believe in it enough that you you do it in spite of the fear. So speaking so, of important things, like people shouldn't think I I I, I should. People shouldn't think well. I feel fear about this, and therefore I shouldn't do it. Um, it's normal to be to feel fear. Like you'd have to there'd have to be something mentally wrong if you didn't feel fear. Um, so you just feel it and let the importance of it drive you to do it anyway? Yeah. I, you know, I, actually something that can be helpful is fatalism uh, to some degree. Um, if, you just, if you just accept the probabilities, um, then that diminishes fear. Uh, so um, when starting SpaceX, I thought the odds of success were less than 10%. Um, and I just accepted that actually probably I would just lose lose everything. Um, but that maybe we would make some progress. If we could just move the ball forward, even if we died, maybe some other company could pick up the baton and move and keep moving it forward. Um, so that would still do some good. Um, yeah, same with Tesla. I thought you know, the odds of a car company succeeding were extremely low. What um, do you think the odds of the Mars colony are at this point today? Well, um, oddly enough, I actually think they're pretty good. Um, so, like, when can I go? Okay. Um, at this point, I am certain there is a way. 
I'm certain that success is one of the possible outcomes for establishing a self-sustaining Mars colony, in fact, a growing Mars colony. I'm certain that that is possible. Um, whereas until maybe a few years ago, I was not sure that success was even one of the possible outcomes. S some meaningful number of people going to Mars, I, th I think this is potentially something that can be accomplished in about 10 years, um, maybe sooner, uh, maybe nine years. Um, I need to make sure that SpaceX doesn't die between now and then, and that I don't die, or if I do die, that someone takes over who will continue that. You shouldn't go on the first launch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, Actually, first, I the wanna... first launch will be robotic anyway, so. I want to go, except for the internet latency. Yeah, the internet latency would be pretty significant. Um, I mean, Mars is roughly 12 light minutes from the sun, and Earth is eight light minutes, so at closest approach, Mars is four light minutes away. At furthest approach, is 20. A little more, because you, you can't sort of talk directly through the sun. Speaking of uh, really important problems, um, AI. So you have been outspoken about AI. Um, could you talk about what you think the positive future for AI looks like and how we get there? OK, I, I mean, I do want to emphasize that um, this is not really something that I advocate or, or this is not prescriptive. This is simply pre hopefully predictive. Because um, people will sometimes say, oh, well, like, like this is something that I want to occur instead mm -hmm. of so this is something I think that probably is the best of the available alternatives. Um, the best of the available alternatives that I can come up with, and maybe somebody else can come up with a better approach uh, or, or better outcome, is that uh, we achieve democratization of AI technology, meaning that uh, no one company or uh, small set of individuals has control over advanced AI technology. I think that that's very dangerous. Um, it could also get stolen by somebody bad, you know, like some evil dictator or country could send their intelligence agency to go steal it and gain control. It just becomes a very unstable situation, I think, if you've got any um, any incredibly powerful AI. Um, you just don't know who's, who's going to control that. So it, it's not as though I think that the risk is that the AI would develop a will of its own right off the bat. I think it's more that's, uh, the concern is that some, someone um, may use it in a way that is bad. Um, or, 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 and even if they weren't going to use it in a way that's bad, that somebody could take it from them and use it in a way that's bad. That, that I think is quite a big danger. So I think we must have democratization of AI technology and make it widely available. Um, and that's you know, the reason that obviously uh, uh, Yumi and the rest of the team uh, you know, created OpenAI um, was to help uh, with the democracy, help help spread out um, AI technology so it doesn't get concentrated in the hands of a few. Um, and, and but then of course that needs to be um, combined with uh, solving the high bandwidth interface to the cortex. Um, humans are so slow. Humans are so slow. Yes, exactly. Um, but you know we we already have a, a situation in our brain where we've got the cortex and limbic system. And the limbic system is, is kind of the, I mean, that's, that's the primitive brain. It's kind of like the, your, your instincts and um, whatnot. And then the cortex is the thinking upper part of the brain. Those two seem to work together quite well. Um, occasionally, your cortex and limbic system may disagree, but they. It generally I think, works pretty well. Generally it generally works pretty well. And it's like rare to find someone who, I, I've not found someone who wishes to either get rid of their cortex or get rid of their limbic system. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, it's, that's unusual. So, so I think if, if we can effectively uh, um, merge with uh, AI by um, improving that, uh, the, the, the neural link between your cortex and the, the, the your digital extension of yourself, which already, like I said, already exists, just has a bandwidth issue. Um, and then, then effectively, um, you become an, an, an AI human symbiote, um, and and if that then is widespread with anyone who wants it can have it, uh, then we solve the control problem as well. Um, we don't have to worry about um, some sort of evil dictator AI um, because kind of we are the AI um, collectively. That seems like the best outcome I can think of.
So you've seen uh, other companies in their early days that start small and get really successful. Um, hope I don't regret asking this on camera, but how do you think OpenAI is going as a six-month-old company? I think it's going pretty well. I think we've got a really talented group at OpenAI, and it seems like yeah, really, really talented team, and they're working hard. Um, OpenAI is structured as, uh, see, a, a 501c3 nonprofit, um, but you know, m many nonprofits uh, do not have a sense of urgency. It's fine; they don't have to have a sense of urgency, um, but OpenAI does, because um, I think people really believe in the mission. I think it's important, um, and it's it's about minimizing um, the risk of uh, existential harm um, in the future. And uh, so I, I think it's going well. I'm pretty impressed with what people are doing and the ta talent level. And obviously, we're always looking for um, great people to join who we're believe in like the mission. close to 40 people now. It's, yeah. It's well. uh, all right, just a few more questions before we, we wrap up. How do you spend your days now? Like, what, what do you mm -hmm. allocate most of your time to? My time is mostly split uh, well, split between SpaceX and, and, and Tesla, and of course I, I try to spend um, uh, it's a part of every week at OpenAI. Um, so I spend most, I spend basically half a day at OpenAI most weeks, um, and then and then I have some OpenAI stuff that happens during the week. But other than that, it's really and SpaceX and Tesla. what do you do when you're at SpaceX or Tesla? Like, what does your time look like there? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of people think I, I must spend a lot of time with media or, or on businessy things, but actually, almost uh, almost all my time, like eighty percent of it, is spent on engineering design, I engineering and design. So it's um, developing next generation product. At, that's eighty percent of it. Um, you probably don't remember this. A very long time ago, many many years, you took me on a tour of SpaceX. And the most impressive thing was that you knew every detail of the rocket and every piece of engineering that went into it. Uh, and I don't think many people get that about you. Yeah, I think a lot of people think I'm kind of a business person or something, which is fine. Like, business is fine. But, um, like, I, uh, but really, it's, you know, it's like it's SpaceX. Uh, Gwen Shotwell is chief operating officer. She kind of manages um, uh, legal finance, um, sales. Um, and kind of general business activity. And then my time is almost entirely with the uh, engineering team working on improving our, the, the Falcon 9 and the uh, Dragon spacecraft and developing the Mars colonial architecture. Um, and then at Tesla, it's working on the Model 3 and uh, you know, some in the design studio, typically uh, um, half a day a week, um, dealing with this aesthetics and, and uh, look and feel things and and then most of the rest of the week is just going through engineering of, of, of the car itself as well as engineering of the the factory because um, the, the, the biggest epiphany I've had thus this year is that uh, what really matters is the is the machine that builds the machine the factory um, and this that is at least towards magnitude harder than the vehicle itself it's amazing to watch the robots go here and these cars just happen yeah. Now, this actually is a, has a relatively low level of automation compared to what the Gigafactory will have and what Model 3 will have. What's the speed on the line of these cars? Actually, the average speed of the line is incredibly slow. It's probably about, um, it, including both X and S, um, it, it, it's maybe uh, five, you know, five centimeters um, per second. And what can you get to? <laughs> this is very slow. Or what would you like to get to? I'm confident we can get to, to at least one meter per second, so a 20-fold increase. That would be very fast. Yeah. Um, at least. I mean, I think quite a One meter per second, just to put that in perspective, is, is a slow walk, or, or like a medium-speed walk. A fast walk could be uh, one and a half meters per second. And, um, and then the, the fastest humans can run over 10 meters per second. So if we're do only doing 0 0.05 meters per second, that's very slow current current per, per, per speed. And, and at one meter per second, you can still walk faster than the production line.